Hi, and welcome to the Talking Animals Law and Philosophy series. This is our last talk in uh, the Lent term program, but we'll be back uh, next term with some more, some more talks. Uh, my name is Raphael Fazel. I am the co-director of the Cambridge Centre for Animal Rights Law. Uh, this is usually the place where I say a few words about how the Talking Animals series works. Some of you may be familiar with it already, uh, but some may be joining for the first time. Uh, we will start with a presentation by our presenter that will last somewhere between 30 and 45 minutes. And that will leave us with around about 40 minutes time for Q&A and discussion. The event will end at 6.30 p.m. UK time, but I'm conscious you may be joining from other time zones. So we've got uh, about one and a half hours together. Uh, Everyone is welcome to come in in the discussion. Um, I would encourage you to use the raise hand function that you find on the bottom of your Zoom app. Uh, then you can ask your questions directly or make your comments directly to our speaker, and it makes for a, a, a much nicer discussion. But if you're uh, uh, unable, sort of in, can't do that, you're in the train, maybe you're in the bus, feel free to use the, the chat box too. That works. That works as well. I will have all the microphones on, on mute until we reach the discussion. Uh, we will be recording this presentation, but not the discussion part. So if you want to watch it later or share it with a friend, it should be on our website in a few days time. Okay, this is all I have on the housekeeping front and it is now my great pleasure to introduce our speaker and that's Professor Jonathan Saha. Jonathan Saha is Professor of South Asian history at Durham University, and his research focuses on the history of British imperialism in Myanmar, which is formerly called uh, uh, Burma, and he looks at the 19th and 20th centuries in particular. His first book called Law, Disorder and the Colonial State was published in 2013 with Palgrave Macmillan, and it looked at the history of corruption in the Ayer Yerwari Delta. Uh, since then, he has also published on the history of imperial masculinity, on crime, medicine, and colonial psychiatry in a wide range of journals. His second book, called Colonizing Animals, Interspecies Empire in Myanmar, came out with Cambridge University Press in 2021. In it, he examines the animal history of British colonialism in Myanmar. Through an interspecies lens, he tackles the topics of commodification, imperial ideologies, and anti-colonial thought. His presentation today is entitled Decolonizing Animals, Elephants and the End of Empire in Myanmar. Jonathan, it's a real honor to have you here. Thanks so much. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Raphael, and thank you so much for inviting me. Thanks everyone for coming along today. I really appreciate it. I don't have any presentation uh, visuals to accompany the talk, so hopefully you'll be content with just watching my face and the words come out of it. Um, but uh, I look forward to your questions and the conversations at the end. Animal studies as a multidisciplinary field has been reckoning with the call to decolonize in recent years. This has been a small part of a much broader call that, in its current guise, first emerged with students challenging historically embedded power structures in the academy, particularly racism. It has taken many forms, but within animal studies, the most prominent part of this call has been to recognize the vitality and interpretive power of indigenous communities' ways of being with and understanding non-human creatures. As Zoe Todd has persuasively argued, post-humanist approaches to thinking about life in the Anthropocene often take concepts from indigenous cosmologies, while in the process, erasing this act of knowledge acquisition and failing to engage meaningfully with those communities. A decolonial approach or as Todd puts it, an indigenizing approach, would put indigenous practices at the center of analyzing, resisting, and expunging, totalizing global narratives rooted in coloniality by situating knowledges in their precise localities. As with Todd's own work, 
The project of decolonizing animal studies has gained most momentum in the context of ongoing settler colonialism in North America and Australasia, where decolonizing appro approaches perhaps go further than the still more ubiquitous efforts of post-colonial critique is in its wider agenda to transform institutions of learning themselves. There is a clearer line between scholarly praxis and political praxis, although the decolonizing agenda is not beyond non-performative co-option by the very institutions most in need of decolonizing with questionable commitment to meaningful change. In animal history, as a subfield of animal studies, the imperative to decolonize is only beginning to percolate through, although studies embedded in histories of imperialism and increasingly colonized societies are now firmly established subjects. However, its parent discipline of history has had its own varied responses to decolonization. One powerful intervention has been the recent conversation piece published in the journal The History Workshop between Amanda Bain, Christina Freyer, Emma Hunter, Elizabeth Leake, Sue Lynn Lewis, and Sarah Miller Davenport, all historians working in UK institutions. They draw attention to the divorcing of the agenda to decolonize histories from the historical study of decolonization itself, here referring to the material processes and lived experiences of the end of empire. This is a sharp and important insight, one that reflects or one that provokes reflection on the nascent decolonization of animal studies. There can be, at times, an ideational, even idealist tendency in some writings on the need to decolonize. I don't mean to be dismissive of this focus. Critical analysis is sharpened by more rigorous conceptualization and a clear awareness of the philosophical stakes involved. Nevertheless, animal history, sitting as it does between the fields of animal studies and history, can be a bridge between the political and philosophical questions of the former and the reflexively empirical methodological bent of the latter. This brings to Thor a central question for animal historians, one that is yet to be systematically addressed. To what extent were animals themselves decolonized during decolonization? The history of decolonization in Myanmar makes for a useful case study. In this history, we can identify themes that may prove to be generative of answers to this question across different times and places. Myanmar's path to independence was chaotic and violent, resulting in some harder breaks with the imperial regime than witnessed in some other successor states of British colonies. Elephants, in particular, were caught up in the conflicts and contestations that marked the transition from colony to nation state. There were two major changes to their lives during decolonization. Firstly, the ownership of most of the colony's working elephants changed hands from European timber firms to the post-colonial state, although both struggled to secure their possession of this vital animal capital. And secondly, the numbers of elephants who were conscripted into the timber industry fell significantly in part due to the widespread disruption in the wake of the Japanese invasion of Myanmar, as well as British reoccupation during the Second World War. At the same time, there were significant continuities. While diminished in number, timber work remained the primary form of employment for elephants in independent Myanmar, continuing modes of capture and captivity that had expanded dramatically during British rule. The ecological transformation of Myanmar under imperialism persisted into the independence era and still shapes the country today with all the deleterious effects on elephant populations and their habitats. These aspects of the history offer valuable insights in and of themselves, but there are more generic themes apparent in the histories of elephants during Myanmar's decolonization. <clears throat> 
two interconnected processes stand out as pertinent to bridging the calls to decolonize animal studies with those to decolonize history. These are the connected mid 20th century state building projects of enforcing borders and building economic democracy. Neither was successful in Myanmar, but in their failures, they transformed the lives of elephants. Now, what follows is somewhat detail oriented and very narrowly focused on Myanmar. So please bear with me. I realize a lot of this will be unfamiliar to you. But what I want to emphasize is that in some ways, the medium is the message. The complexity is part of the story. The experience of British colonialism was transformative for Burmese elephants. The two major export industries that exploded during the late 19th century and through the early decades of the 20th century, rice and teak, both had profound and lasting consequences for these forest dwelling giants. The second half of the 19th century was witness to a rice boom across the Deltic regions to the south of Myanmar. What was a mangrove forested, sparsely populated, at least by humans, rural region under the Kongbaun dynasty that ruled most of the south from 1752 to 1852, became an agricultural powerhouse of rice production. By the 1930s, Myanmar was the world's largest exporter of rice. This dramatic expansion of wet rice paddy fields effectively decimated elephant habitats across huge swathes of the country, increasingly confining wild populations to forested upland regions. Here, they were enlisted into the timber industry in growing numbers. During the late 19th century, the timber industry, and particularly the export of teak, a hardwood that was in great demand across the British Empire for the manufacture of a range of commodities, from luxury furniture to railway sleepers, underwent two significant shifts. The first of these was the rapid expansion of the industry measured both in terms of its share of the global market and by the area of Myanmar's forests used for the cultivation and harvesting of teak. The second was the concentration of the industry in a small number of British financed and managed firms. Both of these shifts were dependent upon the capture and conscription of large numbers of Asian elephants. These elephants were mostly enlisted from the borders of the colony. In particular, British firms recruited in ethnically Karen majority areas to the east of the colony, where, through a patchwork of indigenous systems of government, it bordered Thailand. Elephants enabled the exploitation of harder to reach teak forests, as no mechanical technology could compete with the dexterity and strength of these powerful, intelligent creatures in navigating the challenging terrain of the Burmese forests. The competitive edge that elephants provided to a timber trader meant that British firms able to raise sub substantial amounts of capital that were necessary to purchase large herds of elephants gained an unassailable advantage over smaller Burmese outfits. By 1914, the size of a herd belonging to the largest and most dominant firm, the Bombay Burma Trading Corporation, Corporation alone, was 1,718, and they purchased more than 500 more captive elephants during the interwar years. Prior to 1942, when the Japanese Imperial Army forced the British into retreat, an estimated 7,000 elephants were working across the industry, the majority being employed by just five British firms. The lives of these working elephants were commonly described as being semi-captive, mostly due to the practice of releasing them at night to wander the forest, albeit hobbled by fetters and made audible by bells attached around their necks. The reliance on elephants also placed some constraints on the industry. They required decent, accessible fodder and fresh sources of fresh water to wash and drink. The regime for training them was violent, 
moderated by the need to preserve the physical and psychological integrity of any individual elephant. The aim was to build resilient relationships of trust between the elephant driver, in Burmese called the Uzi, and the elephant. We might consider the process of training as the forging of an intersubjective connection between subordinated Burmese, mostly Karen, wage labourers, and captive, but not fully domesticated, elephants. The lack of full subordination of both colonised workers and elephants to the authority of British capital, represented in the mostly white management of dominant timber firms, was manifest in a perpetual problem that confronted the industry, the disappearance, theft, and smuggling of elephants. Throughout imperial rule, the shifting borders of British Burma were sites of overlapping and unclear jurisdictions, where firms struggled to enforce their claims to possession over elephants. Nevertheless, given the numbers involved in the timber industry by the 1940s, it is very likely but it was during the colonial period that the total population of elephants shifted in balance towards the majority being captive at the expense of wild populations. This shift was entrenched by the reinforcement and reproduction of the elephant workforce through regular capture from wild herds, as captive-born calves never met the shortfalls and were ultimately found to be an unprofitable way of replenishing the labour requirements. The rigorous labour regime also had the effect of undermining female elephants' fertility. This, then, was the baseline from which we might appraise the scope and extent of decolonization for elephants. In many ways, the cracks in the status quo were already appearing in the 1930s. Labour strikes at the timber firm's sawmills and docks brought frequent stoppages. The Sayasan Peasant Rebellion that engulfed the colony between 1930 and 1932 exposed the timber firms to the limitations of the protection provided to them by the colonial state and revealed their need to form their own elephant-backed armed levies through their connection with Karen communities. The growth of anti-colonial nationalism pushed the firms into recruiting more Burmese staff into the higher echelons of their management structures, as well as to attempt to cultivate ties with nationalist politicians. But this was a piecemeal and ineffectual strategy for staving off, staving off nationalist ire at their favourable position. The fissures in the edifice of the imperial order were exposed and became open fractures during the Second World War. The ignominious collapse of British authority in Southeast Asia during the war has been well documented. The human tragedy of the forced displacement of particularly Indian, Anglo-Indian and white communities in fear of advancing Japanese forces is infamous for the callous racial logic behind the prioritization of retreat and relief efforts. The heroics of working elephants in carrying refugees over the punishing mountainous terrain to the relative safety of British India is justly well known and has been immortalized in a range of media, including a recent award-winning children's book. But the fate of the working elephants that remained in Myanmar is much less well documented. Even in the years that followed immediately after British reoccupation in 1944, it was not precisely clear what had happened to them. Save for those few elephants engaged in the arduous retreat to India, or who were conscripted by the British Army, the large timber firms left their essential animals, the most valuable assets owned by these companies, in the care of their Uzis, or elephant drivers, until they returned. Of the Bombay Burma Trading Corporation's 1,972 working elephants before the retreat, around 900 remained in the care of their Uzis. A further 200 have been identified as being owned in the regions of Thailand that bordered British Burma, and, it was optimistically hoped by the corporation, could be recovered. There were two likely outcomes for those remaining 800 elephants. Some would have perished in the brutal fighting and exhaustive total war effort on this front line between two collapsing empires. 
Certainly, the Japanese military sought to mobilize elephant power for themselves, although it would appear they did so with little success. Other elephants, with more luck, would have been able to use the opportunity of chaos in the realm of human affairs to liberate themselves and return to the forests, although the traumas of captivity may have made this a difficult transition. The impact of this loss of elephants was devastating to the rate of timber extraction in the industry, which by 1946, two years after reoccupation, was half of what it had been prior to the onset of hostilities in the colony. This was in spite of something called the Wait Plan, put in place by the returning British government to rehabilitate the timber industry. This arrangement was indicative of the hubristic belief held by some in colonial officialdom that a semblance of the old order could be reconstructed post-war. The Waite Plan saw the state take on responsibility for providing capital to the firms, as well as shouldering the risk of unprofitable sales, while at the same time extending the leases to Myanmar's forests that the five largest timber firms had enjoyed before the Japanese invasion. The inability of the firms to recover their working herds meant that this plan had limited success in rebuilding productive capacity. Nevertheless, there were two innovations in the weight plan that were later to prove the basis for the partial nationalization of the industry. The first was the establishment of the state managed timber board that worked closely with commercial firms, indeed was a major investor and stakeholder in the industry. The second was the formalization of the close relationship between the big five firms into a consortium. The plan was envisaged as an ad hoc interim one, which would hold until the colonial government was in place to resume working with the firms on the basis of long-term leases. However, it quickly became apparent that this was not a transitory arrangement enabling British recolonization, but was a step towards decolonization. The weight plan was pilloried in the Burmese nationalist press as a resumption of the exploitative, extractive imperialism that drained wealth from the country into the pockets of British capitalists. The newly formed consortium lobbied Westminster and Whitehall to renew their lapsing longer term leases to enable them to better fight the nationalisation of the industry that their intelligence on Burmese politics informed them was imminent. As independence went from being a political likelihood to a rapidly approaching inevitability, their correspondence with London became more clamorous and desperate. There was little, however, that colonial authorities were able to do. On the ground, things had irrevocably changed and decolonization was already well underway. Colonial plans for rehabilitating, re rehabilitating the timber industry along the lines that it had been run prior to the Second World War failed to factor in the situation on the ground. The countryside was under British rule in name only. The nationalist forces who had turned on the Japanese and supported the British reoccupation in 1944 were effectively a shadow bureaucracy at the local level in many parts of the country. In other parts, territory was in the hands of communist fighters who, in 1946, had broken away from the largest and most popular nationalist political force, the Anti-Fascist People's Freedom League, headed by the charismatic Aung San. Political power was not in the process of managed transfer, but was being seized from the colonial state from below, ahead of formal agreements. In combination with the everyday problems that the timber firms faced re-establishing their labour processes in this context, the recovery of their working elephants from Thailand was a drawn-out and diplomatically fraught endeavour. The borders were restive and Thai authorities seemed uncooperative. At the same time, new legislation was being passed restricting and regulating movement between Myanmar and Thailand, including laws seeking to control the trade in wildlife. Concurrent to these changes, Karen nationalists launched a rebellion that brought timber operations to a standstill in some parts of Myanmar, 
forcing the Bombay Burma Trading Corporation to abandon some parts of its forests and many of their elephants in central Myanmar in 1947. One productive way of framing these transformations is to consider them as part of the anti-colonial nationalists counter-hegemonic project. That is, parts of the attempt to build a state that both inherited the coercive power of the imperial predecessor, but that also redressed the injustices of the colonial order. This means firstly conceiving of the threats posed to the consortium of British timber firms by the communist rebels, the anti-fascist People's Freedom League, and even their own workers, all as aspects of attempts to realize greater economic democracy in Myanmar. And secondly, to situate timber firms' troubled experiences in Myanmar's eastern border as symptomatic of battles over the geobody of the successor state, particularly their borders. So beginning with the attempts to realize greater economic democracy, British timber firms were unprepared to react to the strength of popular opinion against them. Their strategies of countering negative coverage of the weight plan in the press, of accelerating the Burmanization of their management and lobbying colonial authorities, were wholly insufficient to protect their interests as they missed the centrality of economic democracy to their opponents' grievances. Even getting the elephants that they had been able to recover following the reoccupation back to work proved difficult due to breakdown in labour relations in some of their key forest camps. They faced a reluctance among Karen foresters to take up contracts with them. More concerningly, at least for the firm's managers, strikes also broke out among forest workers during 1947. Workers in elephant camps were not prone to striking, and when they did take action previously, notably in the 1920s, this was in the form of isolated wildcat action rather than through an informal union structure. In the summer of 1947, the Bombay Burma Trading Corporation faced a near total stoppage of their forest operations on the Shweli River in the Shan states to the northeast of the country. While managers sought to downplay the strength of feeling behind the action, a document listing the demands of the strikers emphasised pay. More specifically, they demanded to be paid for their years looking after the elephants between 1942 and the 1945 when the British had retreated. The corporation was sufficiently concerned at the unrest as to sanction the withdrawal of its white supervisory staff. The strike was only broken after the murder of one of its leaders. Ultimately, the consortium as a whole did agree to offer rewards to the workers who had looked after their elephants during Japanese rule, although the amounts fell well short of what the strikers had demanded. The growing power of labour in Myanmar as British rule entered its final months were compounded in the eyes of the consortium by the disruption caused by communist rebellions. In the spring of 1947, dozens of the Bombay Burma Trading Corporation's elephants were seized by rebels in central Myanmar, along with hundreds of small arms. In one instance in March, forest camps found themselves ambushed by uniformed troops whose leader identified themselves as communists. The corporation's records described the rebels as, quote, polite. The concerted fighting was not directed at the timber firm and its agents. The rebels had been engaged with encounters with the military, the police and militias loyal to Aung San. We might instead see the raids on the corporation's operations as framing the timber firms as holding assets, including elephants, that were fair game for expropriation in the fight to realise a social revolution in Myanmar. This might be why the leader of this particular raid was apparently apologetic about the disruption. The timber firms were no longer viewed as powerful obstacles to decolonization. The writing was on the wall for the consortium, and that was legible to communist rebels from the vantage point of Myanmar's mountainous forests, even if the firms themselves were slow to read it. It is against the threat of communist insurrection 
and their seizure of elephant power, that the, the policies of the anti-fascist People's Freedom League towards nationalisation should be understood. The speeches of the League's leaders made it clear that some form of nationalisation was coming. In 1948, over a six month period, the consortium's operations were appropriated by the newly established independent regime. The desire of smaller Burmese timber firms to inherit the favourable leases enjoyed by the consortium were, however, not realised. A newly established state timber board became the owner of the firm's fixed capital, including their elephants, as well as their stock in trade and forest rights. The partial nationalisation of the timber industry meant that the state ownership was the predominant way that working elephants came to be owned. Working elephants went from private capital to being a national asset, but they were still tethered to the production of export commodities. One important exception to this near state monopoly in working elephants was the Karen homeland of Kothuli where the autonomy won in the early years of the civil war that broke out at independence enabled Karen nationalists to exploit their timber through the mobilization of local elephants. Logging became central to the political ecology and economics of post-colonial warfare in Myanmar, and elephants were conscripted into these endemic struggle, struggles. But whether now owned by the State Timber Board or by Karen nationalists, the material conditions of their lives remained, for the most part, the same as during the colonial period, semi-captive and bound to the labour processes of teak extraction. At the same time that the consortium found itself struggling to kick-start operations in the generous leases that they had over forests in Myanmar, it was embroiled in protracted difficulties in its attempts to reclaim working elephants that had been smuggled into Thailand during the war. And this is where we get into that problem of managing and establishing borders. The situation mirrored that of in 1880s through to the 1910s when the colonial state's attempts to establish its authority against rebels and over Shan rulers in the northeast then, as again at the end of empire, the Bombay Burma Trading Corporation lobbied the colonial government to intercede on their behalf to recover elephants that had been stolen and taken over the border, while simultaneously attempting their own initiatives for recovery. The difference in the late 1940s was that neither the colonial state nor the firms themselves had the material strength to wield any authority in the borders. The firms were able to send their agents to identify elephants that may have originally been in their herds, something they were able to do for identifying brand marks on their bodies and through the descriptive roles that detailed the physical specificities of individual elephants. However, regardless of the strength of evidence that they could muster, it was apparent that they could not forcibly recover these elephants, even when they felt the law was on their side. The firms opted instead to try and buy back the lost elephants at competitive rates, although even this appears to have had limited success, as the consortium was still lobbying for intervention from Westminster to pressure the Thai governments to take a firmer hand on the situation. It is worth noting, however, that some firms were playing both sides of the case when it came to the illicit movement of elephants across the border with Thailand. In the years immediately prior to the war, the Bombay Burma Trading Corporation had used the patchwork of jurisdictions in place in the federated Shan states, where British rule was mediated through local rulers, in order to enable them to move elephants from Thailand without falling foul of game laws. In the early 1950s, they were again trying to find creative ways of circumventing legislation in Burma and Thailand restricting the movements of elephants, as well as their attendant human workers, in order to realize an ill-fated scheme to transfer some trained Burmese elephants to North Borneo to commence elephant capturing co operations in the colony. While nearly all of the elephants had become the property of the post-colonial state 
it would seem that the corporation nevertheless retained ownership of a small number of elephants. The plan to move these elephants to Borneo emerged in 1949 and they obtained a license for elephant capturing in the British colony the following year, at around the same time that the Thai government banned the trade in wildlife due to concerns about the depletion of the country's biodiversity. The scheme entailed some tricky diplomatic manoeuvring, as the now independent Burmese government was seeking legal redress from the Thai regime for the elephants smuggled over the border during the war, elephants that they now considered their own. The corporation rapidly backtracked on its historical claims to these elephants, so as not to become embroiled in this case, for the fear that it would unravel their tentative permissions to transfer their own elephants through Thailand and overseas to Borneo. It also necessitated the corporation seeking an exception to the newly passed ban on the wildlife trade. While the archive is silent on the success of these appeals to the Thai government, regardless of whether they obtained legal sanction or not, by September 1951, 10 elephants arrived in Borneo, but the scheme was an unmitigated failure. As early as December 1952, two elephants had died. A year later, only six remained, and the corporation had given up its plan to capture elephants and were now struggling to sell them. They contemplated having to shoot them if they could not find buyers. The ultimate fate of these elephants is not recorded in the documents that I have consulted, but it was likely an unhappy end. The corporation's audacious plan to transplant its activities to a location where British power was still ascendant ended in catastrophe for the last Burmese elephants to live under an imperial regime. I'm going to conclude now. In 1936, George Orwell wrote a powerful essay about his time as an imperial police officer in the Burmese port town of Molimine, where he felt forced to shoot an elephant that had rampaged through the streets, causing destruction in a fit of must. In his essay called Shooting an Elephant, Orwell tried to outline the psychological impact of being a tyrant. He did not want to kill the animal, but felt forced to do so by the audience of Burmese folk in front of whom he could not become a laughingstock. He was transformed in his performance of imperial authority. Eleven years later, after the publication of his story, another large tusker called Pu Tai threw his rider and bolted through the streets of Kyung Jong village, about 200 miles north of Molimine. His killing was captured in a letter in the Bombay Burma Trading Corporation's archive entitled Shooting of an Elephant. Putai too had caused damage to property and crops before being shot, but not by a British police officer, even though this was still formerly British rule, but instead by members of the Pithu Yabor, a group of nationalist figures who were loyal to Aung San. They had been sent to the village to suppress crime, a new shadow police force forged in the heat of total war and anti-colonial fervour. These two episodes, Orwell shooting and this nationalist shooting of an elephant, capture the nature of decolonisation for elephants, crudely perhaps, and an extremist certainly, but they get to the heart of the problem. The change for elephants was mostly in the humans who controlled and killed them. But there is more to the story of decolonization in Myanmar as it affected elephants than the continuation of human supremacist ideologies and practices. Studying the history of animals and being sensitive to the imperative to protect some of the world's most endangered species requires historians to navigate some difficult political terrain. The ways that elephants were enrolled in the nationalist project of greater economic democracy and the post-colonial struggles over the political geobody of a successor state or states and its borders provokes some bigger questions for decolonizing agendas. The two that I think this particular story poses, and very difficult questions I think they are, is how can we marry demands for economic justice with the protection of wildlife? 
And how can the trade in wildlife be combated without reinforcing the violence of post-colonial borders? There are no easy answers here, but the close study of the history of decolonization can, I hope to have shown, refine the questions underpinning the project of decolonizing animal studies, generating productive contemporary problematics from the material and ideological struggles of the past. Thank you very much for listening to me and I look forward to your questions.